Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. We know the Bible can be hard to understand and complicated to sort out all the different uh, issues and questions that you may have as you're reading it for yourself and trying to interpret it. So what we're wanting to do in this series is just to provide some background information, some context, and some helpful resources for you to interpret the Bible. So here's what we want you to know before you read. Micah is considered one of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. It's, con it's included in the Twelve, a collection of prophetic writings combined into one work in the Hebrew Bible and grouped with the Nevi'im or prophets. In its English translation, Micah is divided into seven chapters. The book follows an arc of recognition and condemnation of sin, followed by pronouncing judgment with the hope of restoration. The first three chapters condemn the religious sin of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. They're particularly harsh on those who are in positions of power and their supporters who all have exploited the less fortunate. The whole population is addressed in chapters 4 through 7, and the judgment of sin is framed within the hope of restoration. If you, have, if you know any verse from Micah, it's probably Micah 6, 8, which encapsulates the restorative requirements found in the latter part of the book. The opening verse states the book is the word of the Lord which came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah kings of Judah. The prophet here is identified as a man named Micah and his place of origin as Moresheth. This is probably a village south of Jerusalem, or it could be identified with Tel Judeda 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem near the sites of Lachish and Gath. We don't know much about this individual. He doesn't seem to have been a court prophet the way we see Isaiah, Jeremiah, or even Nathan or Elijah. He seems to be someone coming from the outside of the political elite, since his message is particularly critical of them. His writing is such that he was probably more than a tradesman or laborer because his work is fairly sophisticated, if not quite the same as that of the court prophets. It does show some evidence of education or literary training. One scholar suggested that Micah was a clan leader or a local elder at Moresheth. His prophecies may have been preserved and transmitted by other elders or clan leaders, and he was remembered by his place of origin instead of a patronymic, or who his father was. His concern, his concern for my people in his writing may support such an interpretation. If he was an elder or clan leader, he would rightfully be concerned for the people over which he is responsible. These leaders were responsible for seeing justice distributed, and that is a theme in his writing. While the identification of Micah as a clan leader is speculative, it's certainly plausible. Scholars have identified elements of the book which may come from after the life of the prophet. Such elements were either added in the same line of thought or added as commentary on the original text. There's an extensive body of literature discussing which parts may be original to Micah and which may have come later. And while some scholars see the whole book as original to the prophet Micah, the majority see some subset of the text as reflecting later, probably post-exilic concerns. In general, the majority of chapters 1 through 3 are understood as mostly original to Micah, with authorship of the final four chapters being more debated. We should note that this is only debating authorship, not the book's value, significance, or authority. The prophet Micah's lifetime is given to us in the first verse of the book. It says the word of God came to him in the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. This would give a rough time span of 759 to 699 or 698. Micah may have overlapped with the end of Jotham's reign and beginning of Hezekiah's, so his time as a prophet may not have been a full 60 years. The words may have been written down by the prophet himself, or they may have circulated in another form for a while before they were written down. We do know that at the time of Jeremiah, the words of Micah were well known. In Jeremiah 26, the prophet is threatened with death, but he cites the words of Micah of Moresheth, who prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem. But, his destruction, but this destruction was averted by Hezekiah's repentance. Jeremiah makes the point that Micah was not threatened with death the way that Jeremiah is, but his words were heeded and disaster was averted. All that is to say that Micah and his words were presumably well known by Jeremiah and his contemporaries, so we can assume at least some of the book was widely known at that time. As we just said, there may be some parts of the book that were written well after the life of Micah. Some passages likely date to the post-exilic period. And with that said, there isn't anything in the grammar or syntax that is obviously and necessarily post-exilic. Thankfully, the first verse gives us the time period, the last half of the 8th century. This is a very well-documented period in both the archaeology and history of the ancient Near East. This allows us to have a clear window into the wider context in which Micah operated. During this period, the Neo-Assyrian Empire was a resurgent power after a brief period of stagnation in the early 8th century. 
The Assyrian king Tiglath Pileser III seized the throne, probably in the midst of a civil war, and ended an Assyrian dynasty that had lasted for almost a millennium. Tiglath Pileser began to expand the Assyrian Empire, which brought him into conflict with the kings of Israel. But later Assyrian kings would come into conflict against Judah. In fact, Tiglath Pileser III fought Israel at the request of Ahaz, king of Judah, squarely during the time of Micah. Following Tiglath Pileser III was Shalmaneser V, simply called Shalmaneser in the Book of Kings. This is the king who is credited with besieging Samaria, the capital of the Kingdom of Israel, and after three years' siege, it fell, possibly to his successor Sargon II. Much of the population of the Northern Kingdom was deported, and a new population was brought in from other lands conquered by the Assyrians. And finally, after Sargon II was Sennacherib, this king campaigned against Judah and in 701 laid siege to Jerusalem but didn't take it. And this is likely the context of Micah 1, 10 through 16. This campaign is well documented, and we even have depictions of the siege of the Judahite city of Lachish, which happened during this campaign, and they're well preserved and now in the British Museum. You can check out our video on another literary response to this event in Psalm 76. Archaeologists have found widespread destructions and burned cities that date to this period, which attest to the instability of Israel and Judah during this time. These biblical kingdoms were small fish in a big ancient Near Eastern pond, and there was the ever-present threat of Assyrian aggression. This is the backdrop of much of Micah's warnings about judgment for sinful behavior. Everyone who lived during this time period in Judah would have lived through at least one Assyrian campaign, so the threat of judgment at the hand of Assyria would have been a poignant warning for whoever heard Micah's words. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you like what you see, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any upcoming videos. If you learned something new today, be sure to take a minute and share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.